Uh, I want to begin our time together this morning by thanking John and Michael, if you're watching uh, online right now, for a, a wonderful couple of weeks in Jeremiah. I had a blessing to, to log in and, and watch those services this week, and I just really, truly appreciated both messages, because uh, it's, it's, it's a really tough thing to do. In fact, when John mentioned, like, hey, I've never actually preached from Jeremiah before, uh, I believed that. I understood that. Because it's, Jeremiah is something you like go to in reference, kind of like Proverbs. It's not really something you preach from a lot of times. And so I was really, really blessed by both of those messages. And I just wanted to say thank you for doing that. Um, I hope you were blessed by them as well. And if you weren't, uh, if, you, if you hadn't listened to them, not if you weren't blessed, if you haven't listened to those messages, go back and listen to them this week. Um, so this week, we are continuing in our series, Read Scripture in 2021, as we journey through the Bible from cover to cover. And for the next two weeks after today, and including today, we're going to be continuing kind of in the vein of Jeremiah, but we're going to be looking at a different prophet, and it's the prophet Ezekiel, uh, a prophet who lived during the same time as Jeremiah. So I invite you, if you would, open up your Bibles. If you do not have one with you and would love one, on the bookshelf there in the back of the room, you can grab Bibles there, or you can get your phone app out, or whatever suits you best. But open your Bibles up to the book of Ezekiel. And as you do that, I'd like to invite you to join me for a word of prayer. And one of the things, if you're new here, one of the things I like to do during this time is ask us to, to be reverent, to consider who it is that we're talking to, that he's the maker of all that is, the God of the universe, the one who knit you together in your mother's womb. He's a king. And so how would you go before a king or a president or, or somebody who is as high up as God is? You would do it with, with a physical posture of reverence. And so I invite you to consider standing or kneeling or doing whatever you feel called to do, lifting your hands, and let's go to him in prayer. Most righteous and heavenly Father, thank you, thank you, thank you for the blessing that you've given us today, just to, to have the breath of life in our lungs, to wake up one more day to come and worship you, to lay ourselves aside, to not think about lunch, to not think about laundry, to not think about the, the task list that, that we have to accomplish at work, and just to still ourselves and still our hearts and still our minds and give everything we have to you. Would you bless this time together today as we get into the book of Ezekiel with, with all of its abstract imagery and, and interesting language? Father, would you do something in our heart? Would you stir us? Would you move us? Would you change us? Would you convict us? And more than that, help us not to be a people who feel convicted but go back to doing things the way we've always done them, but to be convicted and change something. I pray that every one of us here would be courageous enough to change one thing as we walk out of this room today. That's my prayer. Father, would you be with us? Give us ears to hear. Give us eyes to see. And may you be glorified. May your spirit be in this place. We love you. We praise your holy name. In Jesus' name, his church said, amen. amen. All right. Thank you, guys. I don't know if you've read the book of Ezekiel before, uh, but the book of Ezekiel is an interesting book, to say the least. Uh, in fact, I heard more than one person this week as I was watching and reading other teachers refer to Ezekiel as a weird book. Uh, weird isn't exactly the most reverent word in the world. It's not a word that I would use, but uh, it, it certainly stands alone in some respects. It's an interesting book. It's an abstract book. Uh, we spent a lot of time this year telling the story of God's people, right? As you go through the Bible from cover to cover, that's what you're confronted with. It's a story of God's people, how he created them, how he made all these covenants and these promises to them, and how he rescued them and provided for them and led them and blessed them, all of these things. And every step of the way, despite all of their failings, and there were many, despite all of their, their falling short, despite the chasm and the separation that existed between him and them because of their sin, what did God do? He came closer and closer and closer. First, he started at the top of Mount Sinai where all the people were at the bottom. But before long, he came down the mountain and he was in the tent of meeting, meeting with Moses outside of the camp where all of his people were camping. 
And then he moved even into camp in the tabernacle and was camped there among the people, right in the center of all the people. He moved closer and closer and closer. And there he stayed. There he stayed, guiding them and leading them until he established a land and a kingdom for the people. And when all of that was finally said and done, when the people were taken care of and all these promises that God had made were fulfilled, King Solomon came in and kind of completed the vision of his dad, David, and he built this, this permanent dwelling place, a temple for the Lord, a magnificent structure where the, the, the glory and the presence of God could dwell with the people in the heart of the holy city of Jerusalem, a place where God would be their God and they would be his people forever. That was the vision. It truly was, in a sense, God with us. But something began to happen once they got there. And, and it's something that happens to each and every one of us in some way, shape, or form. Because how many of you have ever wanted something so bad? Maybe it was a house. Maybe it was a car. Maybe it was, a, you know, I don't know, a, a spouse. Maybe a guitar. I'm going for the rhyme here, as you can tell. And you kind of just knew that, that if you got that person in your life, or you got that thing in your life, you would, you would finally have everything you'd always wanted, and, and life would be good. How many of you have bought into that at one point in time or another in your life? There should be a lot more hands up than that, I think, right? And so eventually, uh, when, when you have your mind focused on something, what happens? You get it, and then what? You love it, right? For about three days. For about three days, you love it, and then suddenly, like everything else, it becomes usual, it becomes mundane, it becomes ordinary, and you just don't appreciate it as much anymore. And that's basically what happens in the kingdom of Israel, that after all of those years of wanting, when they finally had what they'd always wanted, everything that they'd waited so many years for, what happened? Well, the, the kingdom became usual. It became mundane. It became ordinary. It was no longer exciting or appreciated, and they took it for granted. Raise your hand if you've ever taken a blessing for granted before. Amen. And so little by little, something began to happen within them, something deep within their heart. And despite all of God's warning about their drifting hearts, all of them basically uh, went and ignored and, and, and unheeded uh, until the kingdom eventually divided into two. There were two kingdoms, and then each of those two kingdoms were conquered and carried off into a foreign land as exiles. God's people no longer living in this very kingdom that they took for granted. I don't know if you remember the 2008 financial crisis. Do you remember that? Like 10 million Americans ended up with homes foreclosed on, no longer able to, to live where they had been. Well, it's kind of like that, except way worse. Instead of 10 million Americans, imagine if right now, say like 300 million Americans found themselves kicked out of their homes, not able to live there anymore, and, and subsequently kind of marched off maybe to like internment camps in a foreign desert somewhere where they camped, uh, where the banks just kind of bankrupted them and took them there. Like that's, that's the level of heartache that we're talking about here in the exile. And so prior to those four weeks that we spent... Uh, before I went on vacation, where we, we talked about Proverbs and Ecclesiastes and uh, Song of Solomon and, and, and all of those, uh, we spent some time looking at prophets in Scripture that, that dated before the exile, right? We were kind of part of this historical narrative and timeline. We kind of stepped out of that, spent four weeks looking at wisdom literature, and now we're st stepping back into that timeline. And, and when you go back and you look at those prophets that we read, whether it was Isaiah or Hosea or Amos or Obadiah or Habakkuk, any number of these, these prophets, what was their overarching message? By and large, it was a warning to God's people. It was a warning that you need to change your ways or I will, will bring disaster on you. I, I will punish you. There will be consequences for what you've done. And I will remove you from this promised land that you have taken for granted. It was the ultimate, like, dad, like, shape up or I'm turning this car around moment. Like, you need to change or we're, we're turning around and we're going home. And so these last couple of weeks and for the next couple of weeks after today, we're, we're jumping back into that historical timeline, that, that, that 
narrative of God's story, of God's people. But now we're in a different place in that story because rather than warning of a a possible future exile that can change if you guys change your behavior, uh, that didn't happen. And so now we're, we're in exile. God's people have been conquered and they have been carried away and they have been taken into a foreign land. And we read about this briefly some weeks ago when we were in the book of 2 Kings. And so at 18 years old, this new king of Judah uh, takes, takes over. And his name is Jehoiakim. And all we know about Jehoiakim from the scripture is that he does evil in the eyes of the Lord. And so God brings this foreign nation, the nation of Babylon, and their king, King Nebuchadnezzar, to Jerusalem to, to lay siege to the city, to attack it. And instead of fighting back, Instead of fighting what was inevitably going to be a losing battle, Jehoiakim just surrenders. And so I'm going to read here from uh, 2 Kings chapter 24, beginning verse 12. This is what it says. It says, Jehoiakim, king of Judah, his mother, his attendants, his nobles, and his officials all surrendered to him, to King Nebuchadnezzar. In the eighth year of the reign of the king of Babylon, he took Jehoiakim prisoner. As the Lord had declared, Nebuchadnezzar removed the treasures from the temple of the Lord and from the royal palace and cut up the gold articles that Solomon, king of Israel, had made for the temple of the Lord. And he carried all of Jerusalem into exile, all the officers, all the fighting men, all the skilled workers, all the artisans, a total of 10,000 people. And only the poorest people of the land were left. And so Nebuchadnezzar took Jehoiakim captive to Babylon. He also took from Jerusalem to Babylon the king's mother, his wives, his officials, and the prominent people of the land. And the king of Babylon also deported to Babylon the entire force of 7,000 fighting men, strong and fit for war, and 1,000 skilled workers and artisans. And he made Mataniah, Jehoiakim's uncle, king in his place, and changed his name to Zedekiah. So, reflecting on what we just read, there are three things that I want you to see or notice about that text that we just read. Number one, uh, Jehoiakim and the people of Jerusalem are not killed, like you would often think of happening when, when a, another territory comes in and conquers. They're not killed, they're just carried off to Babylon. Two, not everybody is carried off. It's, it's the most prominent people, the most important people, the people of power, the people of influence who are taken out of Jerusalem and taken off to Babylon. And third, Nebuchadnezzar doesn't just immediately go and declare himself king now, like he's conquered this territory. He actually uh, appoints another Israelite king, King Zedekiah, to, to rule over the territory. And all three of these are important in regards to Jeremiah and Ezekiel, but especially Ezekiel, because that's the, the historical context in with which uh, Ezekiel begins today. Because Ezekiel is a priest. In fact, he's probably the son of a priest as well, which means that when Nebuchadnezzar carries off all these significant people to, uh, to Babylon and, and he leaves some behind, Ezekiel's part of that notable crowd, that prominent crowd that that gets marched off to Babylon while all the poor and insignificant people get left behind. And so the text of Ezekiel begins like this. This is Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 1. Ezekiel writes, In my 30th year, in the fourth month, on the fifth day, while I was among the exiles by the Kibar River, the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. On the fifth of the month, it was the fifth year of the exile of King Jehoiakim, the word of the Lord came to Ezekiel the priest, the son of Buzi, by the Kibar River in the land of the Babylonians, and there the hand of the Lord was on him. So, this is five years. Five years into their exile, five years since all these leaders left Jerusalem. Ezekiel's 30 years old which is an important age. You may remember that Jesus begins his ministry at 30 years old. This is tradition for like when manhood begins in Hebrew culture, right? And so he gets this vision given to him at 30 years old, five years in. And for a point of reference, if you don't know where Babylon is, uh, Babylon is today's modern day Iraq. Uh, I don't know if you knew that or not, but it's in, it's in Iraq. In fact, in 2003, you guys remember the shock and awe campaign where we attacked Saddam Hussein in Iraq? 
one of the casualties from that campaign actually was the ruins of the city of Babylon. We lost a lot of archaeological stuff to study because Babylon was in the middle of actually getting renovated and restored to some degree by Saddam Hussein and the Iraqi government because, as I understand it, Hussein kind of envisioned himself as something of an heir apparent to King Nebuchadnezzar. So, I digress. Picture Ezekiel sitting on a river in Iraq, and he starts to see some really, really strange things. If you've read Ezekiel, you know what I'm talking about. He sees four creatures first, and each of these creatures has like four faces. It's a face of a man and an eagle and an ox and a, and a lion. And these creatures have wings, and they're standing next to these four sparkly wheels, except they aren't just wheels. They're like wheels that intersect wheels. And above each of those wheels is this expanse that he describes as being kind of like ice. And above the ice expanse is this throne made out of sapphire. And above the sapphire throne is this figure like that of a man. And he describes it as a man who's glowing metal as if full of fire. It actually reminds me of an activity we did a few years ago at my last church. It was a family ministry thing that we did called Family Circle. And one, one Wednesday night, I went and I described to, to a bunch of young kids all of the depictions throughout Scripture about what God kind of looked like whenever he appeared in visions and things like that to kids. And then I gave kids 15 minutes to go and paint a picture that, that kind of depicted whatever they saw as I read these things to the kids. And so actually, I don't know if you put the, the slide up right now. Um, this is on the wall in my office. This was, this was my daughter Peyton's portrait that night of, of what she saw as I went and, and read all these different passages to her. And it occurred to me this week that what she painted that day, which we thought was pretty cool and poignant, was, was this scene in Ezekiel, this, this kind of glowing man like fire. But I digress. Ezekiel is seeing some things, some strange things. Would we all agree? This is not the ordinary kind of thing that we all envision from time to time. But it's all for good reason. Because God is calling on Ezekiel to speak some really, really difficult truths to the Israelites. But who he is being sent to talk to can get really, really confusing as you read the text because there's a duality of where the people of Israel are. Are they in Jerusalem, where they've come from, or are they in Babylon, where Ezekiel is living now, or both? Who is, exactly is he talking to when he begins to correct their behavior? That's the question. And it's a little hard to discern, but for the sake of time, I can't really dig into that question a whole lot. But it seems clear to me that, that Ezekiel's calling by God is twofold. There's kind of two things happening here. One, Ezekiel is called to proclaim judgment on Israel. The, the people who are there are on Jerusalem, the people who are there right now. The wickedness, the evil that is being done there in Jerusalem right now. But he's proclaiming that judgment not in Jerusalem where all the people are, but here in Babylon, where all the leaders and prominent people are camped among the river. And so the leaders have already been exiled. They've already sort of received their punishment. But now Ezekiel is sent to tell them that more punishment is coming because there is still all this sin, all this wickedness that's happening back in Jerusalem. And God has kind of had enough of it all. He's ready to end it all. And so the exile is not this one singular event where everybody in, in one moment is marched off to Babylon. It actually happens in waves. And so in Ezekiel chapter 8, God gives us this kind of culminating vision to Ezekiel where he says that the Spirit lifted him up between earth and heaven and took him to Jerusalem. If you've ever seen a Christmas carol, you know, remember how he's taken to all these different scenes? That's kind of what's happening here. He's taken to Jerusalem in, in a vision, and when he gets there, he sees the glory of God again. He sees these four creatures with four faces and these intersecting wheels and this expanse and the, the sapphire throne, all of that stuff. And God gives him a tour of, of all the stuff that's happening around the temple, that in the very place where God's glory was supposed to dwell with the people, uh, He's seeing something else, and, and God's going to show him to him. So each place God takes, Ezekiel gets more and more holy, more and more sacred. He takes him first north of the gate of the temple, and there beside the altar is this, this idol, this false idol of jealousy. Next, he takes him to the entrance to the courtyard of the temple, 
And there on, on the walls, he says, are all these animals and, and crawling creatures that are depicted. And he sees 70 elders who are bowed down, worshiping those. Next, he takes them to the north gate of the temple, and he shows them these women who are sitting there, and they're weeping over the gods, over, over this god, Tammuz. And next, he takes them to the inner court of the temple. This is getting closer and closer to the middle. And he shows them 25 men with their backs to the temple, facing the sun, bowed down, and worshiping the sun. And God stops, and he asks Ezekiel a really, really important question, a powerful question. He says, Ezekiel, is it a trivial matter for the people of Judah to do the detestable things they are doing here? Is it a trivial matter? In other words, is this just no big deal to people? This is just no big deal. People just do this like, like it's nothing. It's just trivial. Because in God's eyes, here's what he sees. And maybe you can appreciate this more if you're married or you've been married. Because it's one thing to be like unfaithful in a marriage, right? That's, that's devastating. That, that's horrible. It brings a lot of pain and suffering. But how much more so when that infidelity or that cheating takes place in your own home, in your own bed. Like that's the level of stuff that God is seeing right now. They're cheating on God everywhere and they're cheating on him in his home, in his bed, in the temple. And so the more sacred the space, the worse it seems to get. And so in Ezekiel chapter 10, God does what many of us do. Ezekiel watches him get up and move out. He sees that vision of all those creatures and the wheels and the throne and all that stuff, and it leaves the temple of the Lord. God's glory moves out. And as this vision of Ezekiel comes to a close in chapter 11, God does two things. Number one, he tells them their crime, what they've been doing wrong. And number two, he gives them a message of hope. Their crime, he says, is that they have not kept his laws. They've not kept his commandments. And instead, they have conformed to the standards of the nations around you. This is important. I want you to remember that language. They've conformed to the standards of the nations around them. But, and this is Ezekiel chapter 11, verse 17. He says, this is what the sovereign Lord says. I will gather you from the nations and bring you back from the countries where you have been scattered and I will give you back the land of Israel again. They will return to it and remove all its vile images and detestable idols. I will give them an undivided heart and put a new spirit in them. I will remove from them their heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. Then they will follow my decrees and be careful to obey my laws or keep my laws. They will be my people and I will be their God." So it's a, it's a message of hope and a promise that God will one day not only bring them back, but that he himself will one day restore all of these currently broken relationships with him. Now, here's the thing. I see some of us, we're kind of glossed over as we, we read all this. It's a lot to take in. And I understand all that. Because a lot of us read this and we feel kind of detached from it all. Like, what, what does this have to do with me? I didn't live in those times. I don't live at the temple. I don't, I don't worship little statues or creatures on the wall. I don't, I don't do any of that stuff. What does this have to do with me? These problems are not my problems. This is completely irrelevant to my life. But I'd ask you to stop and consider something. Because at their heart, why was idol worship so appealing to people back in biblical days? Why did people all throughout Scripture fall victim to this stuff. It started at the base of Mount Sinai with a golden calf, and it's continued on all of this time throughout Scripture. Why was that so appealing to people? There's a commentary on Exodus uh, where the commentator Doug Stewart expands on this a little bit, and he actually outlines nine different reasons for why idolatry was so appealing to the people. He said, number one, it was guaranteed. It was selfish. It was easy. It was convenient. It was normal, it was logical, 
It was pleasing to the senses. It was indulgent. He says it was sensual. And for the sake of time, I'm not going to break down each of these and go into detail about what he's getting at. But I want you to just look at this list. And I want you to think about this list in, in regard or in context to your own life. How many things do you do routinely in an effort to appease these same desires within your flesh? How many things do you do routinely that line up with these exact motivations? Like, do you ever do things for others so that they might do something for you? Raise your hand if you're guilty of that, right? That's selfish. Do you ever participate in church community but you only really do what you want to do. Has that ever been you? Because he might say, well, that, that's easy. Or do you ever hang on to stuff or money that, that could go and bless somebody else because you're thinking like, yeah, but what if I need it at some point down the road? I don't want to give up too much because I might need that thing. Well, guilty again. That's, that's the security. That's a guarantee of, of safety, right? Or do you ever find yourself looking at pornography or lust, lusting in your heart, right? That's, that's sensual. And so I could go on, but you get the point. The, the struggle is not this inanimate object that I'm bowing down and worshiping. The, the struggle is the feeling that it gives, like, like a sip of your favorite alcohol or a hit of your favorite drug or that, that casual glance and that inappropriate thought that's coupled with it as somebody who's attractive walks by. That is the idolatry that has plagued all of us since the beginning of time. Raise your hand if you've fallen victim to that at some point in time or another in your life. Man, again, a lot of hands should be going up that aren't going up, right? What I want you to realize is that as Ezekiel gets this vision of Jerusalem, and God shows him all the sinfulness, all the idolatry in the land, it wasn't like this, this switch just flipped. Like one day we're, we're really faithful to God and we're doing everything his way, and then the next day we wake up and we're worshiping 70 creatures on the walls and like bowing down to suns, right? Like that's not something that happens overnight. How does it happen? It happens the same way an addict loses themselves in their addiction. The exact same way. It starts small. It starts with one small bad decision that becomes two small bad decisions that becomes three small bad decisions. And before you know it, they all add up to a catastrophic addiction, right? That's how this starts. It's like when we went on our road trip this last couple weeks ago. <laughs> We leave Pacifica, it's 57 degrees. Next, it's 58 degrees, 59. De like, these are not significant changes, right? You can't tell the difference between 59 and 57. 61, 63. Again, still nice and cool, feeling great. 69, 70, 71. Before you know it, 95, 100, 105, 110, 115. One, you know, and before you know it, we're at 118. One degree at a time. That's all it takes, one degree at a time, and it adds up from 58 degrees to 118 degrees. And there's a world of difference between those two numbers. While I was on vacation, you guys probably heard this event. I think John referenced it in his sermon last week. You guys see the news about this building that collapses in, in, near Miami? I don't know what happened. A lot of people don't know what happened. There's a lot of engineers and investigators who are going to be looking into this for years and months to come. And at some point, there will probably be some big editorial in the New York Times or on, on PBS Frontline or something that will say, boom, here's what we've uncovered. Here's what happened. Here's all the mistakes that were made. And when that report finally comes out and the details begin to leak, I can almost guarantee one thing will always be true, that there were tons of little trivial things that crept up along the way. Tons of little red flags, tons of little no big deals that came up, that were disregarded, where the can was kicked down the road, and before you know it, this happens, right? A little leak here, no big deal. A little crack there, well, that's, that's normal. Cracks happen. A little mistake here, that's inconsequential. No big deal. A missed inspection there, yeah, that's normal. That happens. And before you know it, all these little no big deals add up to something catastrophic. Church, I think that's the point 
of the book, or the beginning of the book of Ezekiel. He says, you have not followed my decrees or kept my laws, but have conformed to the standards of the nations all around you. In other words, one by one by one, you compromised. You compromised a little here, a little there, and along the way, you listened to people who said, hey, no big deal, inconsequential, it happens, that's normal, everyone does it. But you look at a marriage, a marriage doesn't usually dissolve in an instant, does it? It dissolves through hundreds of no big deals that go unchecked and they add up. Addiction doesn't happen in an instant. It happens through hundreds of no big deals that add up. A building doesn't collapse in an instant. It happens through hundreds of no big deals that add up. That's why a rope breaks. That's why a nation falls. That's why bankruptcy happens. And that's why God's people will find themselves exiled in Babylon and Assyria. Church, it doesn't take a big deal to break you. All it takes are bunches of little no big deals that add up. And so if there's one thing I want you to remember about today, and I love, John, I I loved what you had to say this morning for communion because it it lined up. In fact, you used the word unchecked. And you were talking about the same stuff. First John was talking about the same stuff. Left unchecked, every no big deal adds up to broke. Every no big deal adds up to broke. You know, as the glory of God up and left the temple... And as the people of God left Jerusalem and Judah and Israel, it was never because of one mistake. Like we've read enough by now. We've, we've gone through half a year worth of, worth of texts. We've read enough by now to know and to see all of the grace, all of the patience, all of the blessing and providence that God has poured out on his people. This was not because of one mistake. It was because of hundreds of trivial matters, hundreds of no big deals that added up, left unchecked. Every no big deal adds up to broke. And so as Ezekiel sat down with the leaders in Babylon after his vision ended, he says, guys, I got to tell you what I just saw. I got to tell you this message that God gave me to share with you. Do you know what they said? They said, ah, the days go by and every vision comes to nothing. That's what they said. They said, the the vision he sees, that's for many, many years from now. He prophesies about the distant future. He's not prophesying about anything right now. Ezekiel tells them what's coming. The total destruction of the temple and Jerusalem and, and all of that stuff. And what do they do? They scoff. They scoff. They say, yeah, right, Ezekiel. All this stuff comes to nothing. But the reality is nobody believes a building will collapse until when? until it collapses, right? And nobody believes their life is going to fall apart until what happens? It falls apart. And nobody believes they're going to lose their faith, their walk with God, until what happens? Until they lose their faith, they lose their walk with God. The, the people in Jerusalem never stop believing in God. I want, to understand, I want to make sure that we're clear on that. They never stopped believing in Yahweh. They never stopped worshiping Yahweh. What did they do instead? They chose to enjoy him as part of a buffet. It was God and God and everything else. We could call that a diversified portfolio of faith, right? Of worship. Just a little bit of him and a little bit of the sun and everything else. For them, this was no big deal. But for God, this was not no big deal. This was not a trivial matter. This was an adulterous relationship. This was marital infidelity in my house, in my room. And so the book of Ezekiel, the prophet Ezekiel, compels us as Christians to be introspective, to look within each of our hearts and to ask ourselves, what are the no big deals that I've allowed into my life? Ask yourself that question. What are the no big deals that I've allowed into my life? Are they the things that you drink? Are they your phone? Are they what you look at on your phone? Are they the extra hours that you spend at work? Is it the music that you let yourself listen to that you probably ought not? Is it the movies and TV shows that you allow yourself to watch that you probably ought not? Are they the ways that you hold on to money and stuff just a little too tightly? 
Are they the hobbies that you blow a little too much money on? Are they your savings account and your portfolio? Are they the, the little white lies that you allow yourself to tell because eh, it's a white lie? What harm could it do? Are they the abundance of food that you eat? We call that gluttony. Are they the slumber that you enjoy in lieu of, of time spent with God? Are they the promise that tomorrow, tomorrow I'll read my Bible. Tomorrow I'll pray. Next week I'll go to church. Next year I'll get involved. Next year I'll serve. Next year I'll pour myself out. Just not now, not this moment, not today. All of these things by themselves seem like little no big deals. But what do we say? Left unchecked, every no big deal adds up to broke. And so the truth is, church, that many of us have bought into a lie. And it's a lie that says that what I believe intellectually is what matters more than what I do, right? I, I know there's a God. I believe there's a God. What I believe intellectually matters more than what I do because, well, grace, whatever I do doesn't really matter because there's like the safety net called grace and like God's going to catch me when I fall. But what did Dietrich Bonhoeffer say about that kind of grace? Do you remember? Anybody remember that name, Dietrich Bonhoeffer? Say it again for me, John. He says that's cheap grace. It's grace. There's grace there. But it's a cheap form of grace. Ezekiel is deeply concerned, not just with what people believe. Oh, you know there's a God. Great. He's concerned with what they do. Or put another way, Ezekiel requires that we acknowledge that what we do what we actually do is a, is a real reflection of what we truly believe, not just what we say that we believe. And so many Christians, so many of us are good at proclaiming Jesus with our lips, right? Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 15. He's actually quoting the prophet Isaiah. He says, these people honor me with their lips, but what? Where are their hearts? He says, their hearts are far, far from me. They worship me in vain. And so we say all the right things, but when nobody's looking, when nobody sees, when we're behind closed doors, when we're, when we're in the safety of our house, in the dark, what do we do? What do we say about the things that we do? Are they just no big deal? Are they trivial matters? Ezekiel reminds us that they are. They are a big deal because left unchecked, Every no big deal adds up to broke. And if you don't believe me, think about the Last Supper. We celebrated communion. We separated the Lord, celebrated the Lord's Supper a few minutes ago. As Jesus gathers with his 12 closest friends around a table in the upper room, and he's getting ready to breathe his last, what does he say? He picks up the bread, and he says, this is my body. What? Broken broken for you. Every sin, every no big deal in each of our lives, mine included, was just one crack, one insignificant nothing, one, hey, that's normal, one no big deal that led to Christ's body being broken on the cross. And every one of those things left unchecked in our lives, the sin that we don't deal with is, is doing violence to our heart and our soul for Jesus in this life. Because we are either moving closer to God or we are moving further from God, but we are not stationary. We are never stationary. Say never, church. Never. And so when God finally gives his one action item to these leaders by the river in Babylon, what does he say in Ezekiel chapter 14, verse 6? He says the same thing that we've been talking about for ages as the church. The same thing that Jesus said. The same thing that Peter said in Acts chapter 2. What does he say? I love that, that Muhammad said it in his prayer today. He says, repent. Repent. Turn from your idols and renounce all of your detestable practices. In other words, change. Change. Stop doing what you're doing because left unchecked, Every no big deal adds up to broke. And in the spirit of Peter's words in Acts chapter 2, I want to invite you not only to, to turn from those things, to repent, 
but to receive Christ along with it. Every one of us has things that are taking up real estate in our life that shouldn't be there. So when, when everyone was cut to the heart in Acts 2, and they said, what should we do to be saved? Peter says, repent. Every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, be baptized, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You will receive eternal life. You will receive the new Jerusalem. You will receive Israel once again. You will receive God with us. And so if you are ready, whoever you might be, wherever you might be in your life right now, to lay yourself down and to say, you know what? If I'm being honest, I've allowed hundreds of little no big deals, hundreds of compromises to come into my life and they've changed me. And you want to begin to to turn your life around, acknowledge those today, We want to give you an opportunity to do that. And if you've not received Christ in baptism, we want to invite you to do that as well. You can talk to me during this song. You can talk to me after service today. If you're watching online, you can email me at questions at lakemercedchurch.com. And so as we stand and sing, I want to invite you to stand right now. I want to bless you with these words. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Let's sing, church.